Hey boys and girls, uh, welcome back to Monroe Live. I'm here with Jordan and Kevin, and we're gonna take a quick look, and I mean that sincerely, at what we can um, have a look at underneath the vehicle. This is our first real stab at it. We've only had a chance to look at this for a very short period of time, but there's a couple of things that have jumped right out. I'm gonna take the easy one, because I have never seen anybody put a little piece of plastic over the top of the um, um, over the over the top of the underside of the of the front suspension, I, I'm certain that this is some kind of an air duct or something, or maybe it's to gather mud, because this has got a great big, huge area that I could fill up with mud. Maybe that's so you can win the prize when you go on a off-roading adventure. But uh, but there's my first kick at the cat. Who wants to do the next thing? The long. <laughs> yeah. So air. I mean. Regarding the shield, Sandy, definitely with you, definitely an aero provision, probably also to help from stone impingement at the leading edge. My criticism here would be the, the number of fasteners. Like if, if you're going to have this shield and you've got a casting, it'd be great to see a way to figure out how to snap that in place versus using three separate bolts to do so, or at least kind of clock and lock or, or tab and, and set something along those lines. But, but it's still um, going to fill up with mud. I mean, still gonna, I, when I take this off road, yeah, I guarantee you that is going to be filled with mud. No doubt. Yeah. And in the world of corrosion and, and mud collection, you got two schools of thought. One, keep it sealed out so nothing gets in there. Two, open it up enough to where if something gets in there, it can get back out. And right now I'm not seeing outside of, you know, a gap on the backside here. If it's proper mud, such as clay, yeah, it's, it's going to pack yeah, in there. Yeah. So you so anyway, said just injection molded or just thermoform? Because it's pretty simple. Yeah, I, I the do. The fact that it's bolted on versus, you know, not wrapping around or any other features. Actually, I bet you're right. I'll bet you it is it thermoform. I think it is thermoform. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, so let's move on. Let's have a look at this uh, Gigantor member right here. I'm uh, at a loss. Actually, there's two things. There's that and, the, um, and a single stamped uh, upper. Control arm. That those are two things that I think are kind of worth commenting on. Yeah. So from a suspension architecture perspective, what Sandy's referring to is the the long forged aluminum piece. So that piece of aluminum that you're seeing go and wrap around the top of the tire there. And the point at where that connects up top, there's another ball joint up there, <coughs> and that piece is a single piece stamp steel upper control arm. And you might be like, well, if you know control arms, this is the exception, not the rule. Most folks are doing a multi-piece stamp steel weldment, or they're doing forged aluminum, or they're doing what we've seen on other Teslas, for example, stamp steel, but with injection molded reinforcements on the backside. But to do what the Cybertruck has done, just stamp steel, most folks are not doing that. Um, but one of the things that allows them to get away with it, or two, I should say, is one, the suspension architecture. So when you've got a really long knuckle like this, and this is an SLA, virtual ball suspension. Um, the upper control arm is not generally considered load bearing. It's rather considered a follower in the suspension system. The load bearing control arm is the lower. And so this is taking the brunt of a lot of the loads that this suspension corner is going to see. The top one is really just in tension for the most part, meaning keeping the wheel um, from cambering in or cambering out, but in an exaggerated manner. So the long knuckle that they have there, right? There's a big span, meaning between center, center axis of the hub or lower ball joint, pick your poison. The distance from those to the top ball joint is pretty significant, but that's helping in terms of minimizing the load at the top because what they're getting at the end of the day is a long lever arm. That lever arm is really helped managing all the energy that is coming up from the road, cornering, so on and so forth, that the, the Cybertruck's gonna see going through the paces. 
Well, I will tell you for sure that from a, from a driving standpoint, whatever they're doing in the front really worked for me. I was uh, very happy um, in uh, the driving experience that I've had so far. Absolutely. And it's not the first time we've seen a, you know, a single ply stamped upper control arm. The MDX, the Acura MDX, I think, is the first time we saw it a few years ago. Um, their strategy is a little bit different, a little bit deeper draw with a little bit more of a lip. I think it would actually, it might be a little better in some contexts with yeah. respect to the, it's all packaging, with respect to what the ball joint is with the Cybertruck, but uh, I think their execution might be a little bit more robust on the edge there for the, where the ball joint interfaces. But, so it's not necessarily the first time we've seen it, but a lot of people don't go that route, but there's definitely some assembly enablers. It's one less tool. Yeah, exactly. what, like as far as clamshell welding, uh, no welding operations. I'm not sure if they're wrapping or welding uh, at the upper control arm mounts, but. One in the back, to your point, Kevin, on Hondas, we'd often see multi-link suspensions all single ply in the rear. But I think specifically on an SLA, upper control arm, you know, it is, again, it's not unheard of, but it's the exception, not yeah. the rule. It's but if they don't need it, I mean, if your FE8 a finite element analysis says, I don't need it, why do it? Just because of the past? Tesla is not a big fan of uh, doing things, you know, like from the past. They pave the new trail. So anyway, what, do, what, do, what have you um, spotted here that you're interested in, Kevin? I mean, there's a lot of things, but um, no, I mean, it, when you kind of come forward back, it's their, their cradle strategy is very similar to other Teslas with it being stamped, again, a clamshell, but with this Y. Uh -huh. When you look at even their tow hook, similar, it's a little bit simpler than the Rivian execution, but essentially they're bolting in the side here of the vehicle. It's probably hard to see there, but there's recess provision. So when you hit something, it'll just essentially, uh, won't even shear some of the bolts off. They just come loose and then start to move rearward, which is kind of interesting. Um, but overall, I think when you look at the geometry of the cradle, it's, it's pretty elegant. Uh, we always yeah. look at Sorb as being, I don't want to say a costly execution, but you end up oftentimes with, you know, members and structural parts that are, are just along for the ride, except for the, that type of crash event. And I think Hessel does a pretty good job of, of using those, uh, those structural monuments in, I guess, everyday use, if that makes sense. We saw that Sorb absorber, oh, or yeah. whatever the heck it is, bumper. Yeah, there's the point. The piece that Sandy's pointing to is just on the inside or in the leading edge of the front knuckle assembly. We saw this. This is a separate bolted in piece of aluminum bolted to the front end of that knuckle. That, upon first glance, doesn't appear as though this was assumed or protected for in the initial design. In fact, what, what we think may be happening here is they needed to reduce the amount of gap that they have in a static sense between the, the front knuckle and the wheel. So in a Sorb event, the wheels are not always your friends, meaning they're a very hard object, believe it or not. And in that Sorb event where it's just 25% of the vehicle hitting a small overlapped rigid barrier, which is what Sorb stands for, when this wheel suspension module, all the body structure and all the elements in the front get to a point of what we would call stack up, right? To where they're all compressing against one another. If this wheel doesn't give way in one way, shape or form, whether deflating the tire, cracking the wheel, turning the wheel out of the way, like the whole kinematics of that event, then you start to get, go towards the cabin. Cabin, obviously intrusion is not a good thing. And so what, what, I'm, what I'm thinking, looking at this, right? And obviously we're just starting to look at it, is that more than likely they wanted to decrease the space between these two such that they could do one, or possibly two things here, but one of which I believe is probably to help fracture the wheel, to help break the structural continuity that the wheel has in order to get that out of the way. And alternatively, and they may be trying to do multiple things, they could be trying to load up the suspension quicker within the event to help compromise some of the structures within this corner in order to, again, get it out of the way within the event. It's, it's hard to say without actually watching the event and observing the kinematics in play, but that is not something that is really beneficial to the suspension system. I, I believe that's probably a sort of countermeasure. Yeah. Do you well, think it's tunable? I, it could, Maybe on a lighter vehicle that it, they change it? Could be, it could I, be. I think it's because there's two giant bolts in that thing. I think what they did was they made it so that, um, okay, it's sticking out there and it will hit that wheel. But I think the bolts going into it, I've weakened that one area here where you actually get to the knuckle so that maybe with the with those two bolts in there 
I'm going to, I'm going to be able to get rid of that ball joint in a hurry. As soon as that's gone, this thing's going to go flat and head off in, an, in another direction. It's not going to be heading into the, uh, into the cab. I, I think there's more to this because it's even got a, it's even got a little mark on it. I don't know what the heck that's for, the little blue uh, inspection mark, but something probably more, something more happening than, than sure. maybe what we're, what we're aware of right now anyway. Because typically, I mean, this has a larger wheel. It's a 20 inch wheel. Uh, and you know, with vehicles with larger tire packages, such as like, you know, the TRX, the Raptors, anything like that, it's running like a 35 inch tire or above, they typically well, have a little bit smaller wheel. isn't it? What no, is I this? believe it's roughly 35. 30. Let's see, 285, so it's actually a little bit smaller than that, it's like, uh, 85. But a lot of times these larger tires are extremely forgiving for Sorb. Um, and you may not necessarily need to run a lot of the countermeasures that you typically would, given the size and the volume, because they, they help out quite a bit uh, during the event. But this has a lot larger wheel package than a lot of your more off-road focused vehicles mm -hmm. where sometimes you'll see um, those strategies change for small overlap. Yeah. But. So other than that, like looking at what else we're seeing, um, they did a front steer, meaning the steering rack is in the front of the spindle or the drive shaft. Um, so there's some trade-offs in doing that, but their EPS, electric power steering systems, forward of that, it looks like it's hard to tell. Can you see if that's isolated or hard mounted? Kevin? I believe it's. But I mean, that would Both make sense now because having it in the front, it's it's all steered by wire. So uh, having it as far forward as I can get it, I well, don't have. I, I get more room. Well, exactly right. And so typically, you know, what Sandy's referring to is steer by wire. There's no eye shaft. As if you've watched any of the videos, there's no intermediate shaft, which is what eye shaft stands for, going from the passenger cell to the steering rack, the, the ultimate uh, mechanics out front here. And so because of that, all the packaging, the motor, the gearbox, the half shafts, all the other stuff that's directly above me, that does not need to accommodate that, that envelope that typically passes through a shaft. So you are afforded the ability to put that rack in more flexible positions for sure. Yeah. Yep. So we have a pretty much a standard kind of little radiator right here. I don't see much of anything, but I didn't pull this down. Do we see anything in here? Can we, is there sensors or it doesn't look like anything. Yeah, they've they got their pedestrian speaker off to the right hand side. Sandy, where, where your hand's at there. Um, and they do have active grill shutters, you know, at the lower end here, kind of the, the entrance to that cooling module up front. So they are, you know, they, they do have the ability to manipulate how much air is coming in there, you know, lower temperature, lower speeds, right? They'll keep it closed up. Um, higher speeds where you've got good airflow, they'll open that up. Um, but yeah, other than that out front, a lot of what they've done is just, to me, good, efficient structure integration, meaning they've got hard mounted fixed cradle to the, the rails, which are pretty splayed. They're pretty far outboard, it looks like. You know, whether that's they start outboard or they start inboard and go outboard, um, it's kind of harder to say. I can kind of make out and trace them back. But good structural load pass to center of vehicle. That's center line of vehicle is where you're picking up some of your major, major torsion mounts for the drive line. So overall, I would say it looks like a decent structurally integrated execution up front. Mm. The one thing that I didn't know about is that, so over here you've got a little... Um, sound absorbing um, mat. You guys had a special name for it? Yeah, it, Sonazorb is one of the trade names that it goes for, but essentially it's a uh, compression molded and, and heat staked uh, PET, but and not molded, that's, that's a poor name, um, but it's really just heat staked, right? So it's multiple so, layers of it, laminates comes out in a sheet, and then it gets heat staked to itself. It's interesting because we've seen- I just don't understand how much that could possibly add to noise abatement? Well, typically if you're doing NVH wheel liners, it's, it's a molded P, a compression molded yeah, right. PET. It's the fibrous stuff that you've seen, right? Yeah. Um, the benefit of doing what they've done um, and the, the downside of the PET compression fibers is that these are not gonna absorb any moisture, right? So what happens with the PET fibers, the exposed fibers over time, they actually saturate and they almost completely lose their NVH advantage. And so by placing the NVH pads on the backside, 
this is sort of the, not the best of both worlds, but everything is a series of compromises. But this doesn't allow those to get saturated, thus sort of preserving the NVH characteristics that they're looking for. Cool. Yeah. Well, let's move back, see what else we got here. So who found the, uh, the open connector? <laughs> so, yeah, we were, we were poking around in the back of the battery pack. So they've got one open connector there for high voltage. And so um, this could be provisional for another package. This could be an additional form of charging and or if you want to have something in the bed, not quite sure. Um, that's one of the things that we're probably going to dive further into. But in several instances so far, we've seen some connectors, both high voltage, what you're sh seeing on the, the screen here, and then also low voltage like right here, for example, this is below the rear arrow shield next to the hitch. You're seeing connectors um, that are just plugged at the end, meaning they're unused. They're not actually going to an address within the vehicle. Um, in a low voltage capacity, typically those are one of two things. It's either this vehicle may not be equipped with another feature. On this one, that seems unlikely. Um, no, this has got everything. You can't buy any more on this. Um than what I've got. It's right. got the works. Right, however, so. if they're launching another model, maybe that we're not privy to, for example, and there's another feature, they may want to provision another connector here. Um, also, another thing that OEMs will do is they'll leave open connectors for the purpose of general assembly. So if a, along the assembly process, they need to plug in, let's say they needed to calibrate something with all-wheel steer, um, and they just wanted to hook up, do direct feed to the harness, they'll leave themselves connectors like what we're seeing here. So in this particular instance, we're gonna dive into the electrical architecture, but at this time, can't say why they did this one in particular, but for sure, we're seeing open connectors. So if you come back over here, you can have a look at how the um, rear wheel steering looks. Yeah, the, a, a large portion of the, the architecture, the major bones um, seem very similar to what we saw on the Hummer, in fact. So looking at the Hummer's underside, um, it's almost like that kingpin setup with ball joint at the top and bottom and the rear knuckle, mm -hmm. similar to what you'd see in a heavy duty truck application in some instances. It kind of has that kingpin um, sort of assembly, upper control arm, lower control arm, and then pivot along that axis. The, the steering rack in some vehicles that we've seen with all wheel drive or all wheel steer, I'm sorry, you, you would see that they've got almost two identical steering racks. So the front, a conventional front steering rack is just packaged and sort of reconfigured to fit back here. Um, this version from what, from what I can see, which frankly is not a whole lot because it's right above this cradle, it looks to be uh, more like what we saw on, I believe is the Audi Q8, which is just a plunger system. So it's a much smaller unit, much more compact, um, but it does require the outer tie rods in effect, which in this case, it's almost like a, a, one of the multi-links of the suspension um, with a turnbuckle here and some jam nuts. It, it requires that to be longer, go inboard, further up in vehicle. So trade-offs, but I would say the steering unit in and of itself is going to be much more compact in the Y direction. Mm. What do you think, Kevin? No, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to see just from an overall packaging exercise. We were just, I'm just kind of looking at the casting um, here in the rear for the rear cradle. And we were talking through just some of the marks on it um, just a few minutes ago and you can kind of see um, these individual layers here so they look like they're they're tooling cuts not that you need to clean a tool uh, per se especially for uh, any component that's underneath or part of the underbody but one of the things that we were discussing is whether or not they were going through and making you know last minute changes um, whether it be for weight optimization or just or strength or anything like that or you, flow or flow yeah um, based off of some early tool tryouts and you can because you can see in some cavities there's additional passes and others there are not so that's kind of interesting uh, again you don't need to clean this all up it almost looks like it's like a rapid manufactured part but um, it's just interesting to see selectively in certain areas throughout the cradle where it's present and where it's not where they may have kind of come back in to touch up um, mm -hmm. areas or optimize you know the part itself well, I will tell you um, I, I did design um, molds and dies <clears throat> when I was um, when I was in that kind of a business, and quite frankly, I never touched anything. I never wanted to polish something that was in the line of draw, sure. because it's just a waste of money and time. It saves you money 
if you don't uh, go past, like do five or six sure. passes, one is enough. And this looks like a very small mill cutter already. I, I can't imagine going into anything tighter than it. Yeah, a saying that saves time is don't let perfect be the enemy of good, right? Exactly. Well, at the end of the day, um, everybody's trying to save a buck. And if I can save, what would that be? 10, 15 hours on a machine that cost me 600 bucks an hour, um, not to mention the guy that's standing there watching it work. Um, it, um, you know, it's worth your while. Yeah. I, very few people, apart from us, <laughs> very few people are going to be looking on the underside of that casting. Yeah. And then obviously like the battery pack itself. I think uh, one thing that's interesting trend wise, you know, completely stamped. So uh, you'll see essentially trends where you'll see a lot of extrusions early on. So low capital investment, um, sometimes high piece costs with that, uh, depending on when you're, where you're getting them sourced. And then a migration to sometimes castings being integrated, but much like, you know, vehicle body structures, things of that nature, it's hard sometimes to beat for cost, especially when you have the volumes that are high, sure. just stamping. And that's something we've seen with Tesla that they've gone away from, in some areas at least, you know, extrusions and castings towards the end have gone to large stamp assemblies and, uh, and just a casting here where they're getting a lot of feature integration where it makes sense to yeah. um, versus relying on a lot of extrusions. We do see one here. So I imagine this is probably, we don't have a magnet, but uh, you know, all stamped aluminum with this extrusion beam. Yeah, if it's, I believe it's similar architecture as the Model Y, which would mean that that's aluminum. But one thing, you know, Kevin, you were mentioning stampings versus castings that I found very interesting on this one is the electronics bay, which is where all these high voltage connectors are potted into. So you look at um, this piece right here. So it's this sort of line, you know, uh, greenish hue piece right here. On the Model S, Model Y, Model X, all the other vehicles, that electronics bay one in plan view is much more forward in vehicle relative to the battery pack. So that electronics bay sits directly over the top of the battery. And what that also means is that the high voltage connector, connectors went in the X direction from the rear end of the battery pack going into the battery pack, you know, and then to the electronics bay. In this instance though, that electronics bay is actually cantilevered over the rear end of the battery pack and it's a cast aluminum piece. So to me, when I'm looking at this, one, I believe that they're probably using that electronics bay for some measure of structure, whether just the battery pack itself to, to better stabilize it or stiffen it, or they may be using that to stiffen the body structure as it's bonded to it, you know, or fastened to it. So that's quite a change in, in terms of the overarching uh, architecture between outgoing or, or previous battery packs that we've seen in electronics bays relative to them. You know, again, I'm talking about that plan view dimension, right? You know, fore aft of that electronics bay. That That's quite a departure for Tesla in terms of that specific area of the battery pack. And then having all of these vents hanging out the bottom side like this. See these spot welds, I, I just started looking at them. I, I can't believe how well they're done. Remember when we got the, the first Teslas I about fainted. I couldn't, there was uh, impedance, it's splash when you don't have the tips right and whatnot. These things here, they all look like little teeny dimples that, um, you know, were put on with a machine tool or something. They, they really did a big, I mean, these, these guys should be teaching welding classes to, uh, to the, rest of the, uh, the rest of the planet. They really did a good job on the, uh, on the spot welds here. And one of the more interesting things to me, Sandy, along those lines is that they'll do that to the to castings as well. Like on the Model Y, yeah. right? The gig castings, they'll spot weld from steel or, or from a, no. a stamping, I'm sorry, yeah. a stamped aluminum piece right to a cast aluminum piece with a yeah. spot weld, yeah. which um, a whole nother set of difficulties in doing that. Well, at the end of the day, nobody can beat Tesla when it comes to material science. And you don't get stuff like this happening just cause. I mean, tips are one thing, but the, uh, but the end of the day, the, the real magic is when you can get similar materials or dissimilar materials, I should say, uh, to, uh, to bond and join. And this, I'm sure these, oh, I'm not sure. This is something you don't see every day, Sandy. You know what that is? That is the head of an SPR. 
Thank so you. you rarely see the SPRs in this fashion, meaning without the e-coat or paint. So you're actually able to see the head of the SPR. And if you wrap your finger around to the top, you can feel the B side. Where that, so SPR stands for self-piercing rivet, yeah. where the top side of it is coming through. So that's kind of neat for folks who've never actually seen what they look like, yeah. um, showing them going in. So what, to me, what it's saying is either um, spot welds weren't working, they've got dissimilar uh, materials more than likely, right? So aluminum maybe to a steel lid. Probably the seal. Yeah. 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 Pardon? It's the seal. Oh, you think that they're using well, the... Yeah. It's being yeah, joined together and you don't yeah. want to weld through right. the, yeah. so the seal. So this would be the perfect application. And this is what we did when we were working with Range Rover uh, before the, well, when they were bond, when they were part of BMW, um, we did the same thing. And, and the reason for that was the glue or so, the RTV. RTV. Yeah. yeah. So that would be why they, uh, why they did that. That's but room that's temperature still vulcanizing. Almost Seals. never see that. <laughs> What's that? I was just helping folks with the acronym, the room oh. temperature vulcanizing seal. Everybody knows what RTV is, but doesn't know what it actually means. That's for right. Sure. Yeah. 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 Up until a second, I didn't. Yeah, you got same here. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there's there's a line here, and that side is uh, uh, the little fella. Well, we don't want to say that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Anyhow, um, well, we're approaching that magic minute uh, that we've got to shut down here. So, um, anyway, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Jordan, Kevin, thank you so much for uh, for watching, and keep tuned in because. There's a lot of stuff that we're going to be doing here in the very near future. So keep watching and we'll see you soon. Bye now.